October 24, 2019, uh, planning board workshop this evening with the Downs. Uh, if you could all just rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Uh, Dorian, did you want to roll? Nicholas McGee? Here. Rachel Henderson? Here. Ron Javili? Here. Robin Saunders? Here. Rick McNeary? Jennifer Ladd? Here. Rick Mindy? Here. Thank you very much. Uh, so this evening, um, we're going to look at Crossroad Holdings, LLC. It's a request for a master plan review for the town center residential neighborhood. Uh, we do have some time constraints uh, this evening. We're going to try to keep this to uh, 7.30 stop time. I know that the applicants have places to be. Um, and we also believe that... Um, I'm not that excited. We're going to a sand <laughs> <laughs> This is being recorded, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> very exciting. We're going to <laughs> So, uh, with that said, though, we, we do feel this is a, a large enough uh, large enough project and plan. It's probably going to need another workshop anyway. So, I, I think um, an hour and a half we should be able to chew off some of the big items. So, with that, I'll let uh, Chanel or Jay uh, kind of do a little primer on this for us. Enjoy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so based on the board's review of site inventory and analysis, the core planning district, the applicant has submitted a master plan uh, to the town center residential neighborhood at Scarborough Downs. Uh, so this portion of land is located to the north of the existing phase one uh, mixed residential neighborhood uh, to the south of the future town center. So as a reminder, the master plan phase is intended to lay out plan development will be developed, including the proposed use of various parts of the site, the primary road and pedestrian network, the primary utility network, the overall approach to stormwater management, uh, proposed development in open space areas, proposed buffers, and the proposed development standards that will apply to future development proposals. So a few comments. Um, so the, the applicant's narrative for the project uh, indicates that the development uh, could include some light retail and commercial. However, staff is unable to see, uh, see this on the master plan. Uh, so staff has recommended the applicant include areas for light commercial and retail uh, to help transition from the phase one residential portion to the future town center. Staff has also noted that one of the key pieces of the master plan phase is to, is to ensure that each phase of development is coordinated with future phases. Uh, so given that the course track is adjacent to this phase, uh, staff has recommended the applicant provide the board with an update regarding the future of the track and how this master plan is intended to be coordinated with any future development on the site. In regards to street design, uh, based on lessons learned from past projects in town, uh, all of the town departments have decided that the minimum width of streets with vertical curbing should be 22 feet. Additionally, the applicant should design the streets to include designated on-street parking uh, where desired. The applicant did indicate that 10% of the housing units will be affordable as uh, required by the ordinance. However, did not include any details of how this will occur. So these details need to be provided uh, prior to master plan approval. A few more. The applicant did provide a proposed space of bulk regulations for the materials. Uh, staff has recommended that these regulations also include the variable setbacks uh, proposed as well. So these will, the applicant should discuss these uh, proposed regulations tonight. In regards to traffic, it is likely that this development will result in some off-site improvements. Uh, the applicant and the board should start a discussion about the type of improvements that will be required, including the intersection of the Scarborough Downs Road and Route 1. And finally, this development will require state approvals from DEP and DOT, so the applicant should provide the board uh, with an update on the required permits and the anticipated timeline. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, John. Sure. And I'm happy to sit here and look for you now over the Sit here if you want to. Okay, thanks. So, Dan Bacon here on behalf of the Downs, uh, you can see the landscape architects, um, and Nick's going to provide the majority of the presentation, uh, but I'll provide some high points to, to kind of 
and kick things off. Rocky Brusbera is here also on behalf of Crossroads Holdings. Um, so we're really excited to be uh, before the board and having this workshop kind of dedicated this next phase of the project. Um, and as Jim Allen introduced, it's really the area just north of Phase 1. Uh, what we're calling the Mill Village District is Phase 1. So it's essentially between Phase 1 and the outer track of um, the, the racetrack. So as you can see up there, there's both the, the inner half mile track and the outer mile track. And um, to kind of answer that initial question around the boundaries of the district and, and the, the future of the track, um, there is still a lease in place with the operators of the Harness Racing Track. And so we were intentional about designing this next residential phase to not infringe on that lease area. Um, and that's um, specifically why this, this next residential area is south of that outer track. Um, but we've been really deliberate about the design of the infrastructure and the, the, the blocks so that it can be logically extended um, onto the land where the outer track is today um, after decision, decisions are made around um, the outer track. So the outer track is really a practice track. It's not integral with their operations, but they, it's within their lease area and they'd like to maintain it for at least a few more years. So that's why we've deliberately shown um, this area to be outside of that, but developable uh, into that as time allows in the future. Um, in terms of overall permitting, a lot of the work that we've been doing the last uh, many months, in addition to this master plan uh, design work, is to work with uh, DEP and DOT on kind of the, the next round of permitting and establish what we're kind of calling umbrella permits that. Um, really pertain to the rest of the downs and coordinate really well with the town review process. So DEP has worked with us on a long-term permitting process that's very similar to the town's master planning process. Um, and we recently submitted that. And this enables um, us and, and the planning board and DEP to review really in a, in a concurrent way so that we're all looking at the same um, part of the project at the same time, etc. So um, that's been applied for, and within the next few weeks, we'll apply for the area uh, specifically for this town center residential district, and that will be reviewed under the same timeline as the planning board. In terms of DOT, we've done something similar and have applied for uh, a traffic movement permit that's more than this next phase, but actually includes what we're projecting would be the traffic and transportation needs over the next five years. Um, so that then, uh, basically a, a phasing plan can be established for when off-site improvements are needed, uh, etc., based on the, the trip generation of, of various aspects of the project. So that also has been applied for, so that can line up with the town's review process between now and uh, you know, the winter and early spring. So that's really the status of the state permitting, and it's been applied for so that it's, it's pretty uh, concurrent with the, the planning board review. Um, in terms of affordable housing, phase one, we provided 10% of, uh, met the 10% affordable housing requirement, um, and did that uh, with a mix of different unit types. And I think all but one have been sold or rented, um, and I don't think any other development in town has been able to, to do any of that. So we're pretty proud of being able to deliver on um, the affordable housing requirement in phase one. For this phase and future phases, we've deliberately um, teamed with um, Developers Collaborative, who are moving forward with senior affordable senior project um, in phase one. And there's two different buildings proposed, I think you reviewed it at your last planning board meeting. Um, one with 39 units and one with 38 units. So all 77 units are intended to be affordable and to meet the town's definition um, for affordable and is allowed for in the zoning. There is the ability to essentially credit affordable units towards um, other phases and other parts of the project. So that's the intention of, of um, Crossroads is to have that, those senior units uh, count towards uh, this next phase and uh, 
presumably future phases, because it's going to be more than uh, a 10% requirement than just this next phase. Um, in terms of the mix of uses, uh, we're working our best at uh, delivering a mixed use project. Obviously, the innovation district is moving forward. We'll be uh, coming forward over the course of the winter for a master plan for really the, the first town center component or commercial component with uh, sports complex and, and uh, other uses around it. Um, so, so far, that's been our focus in terms of delivering um, a mixed use project. We'd love to see some light commercial in this next phase. Um, and we just don't know if it's sort of viable yet from a market standpoint. It's still going to be sort of at the end of a, a long, longer dead end road for, for the next year or so. Um, so I think what the team has talked about is uh, showing an area in this next um, district where it's possible. And as it builds out, um, we'll see if there's some, some market demand for, you know, it could be some small office. It could be a coffee shop. It's something that's um, integrating well with the neighborhood. Um, so those are kind of some high level uh, comments on, on some of the staff's comments and where we're at. Um, at this point, I was going to have Nick kind of walk through the look and feel of this next phase and uh, the design goals that we have, and, and we can open up for your discussion. Yeah, so pretty excited about this next phase. Um, I want to start by kind of defining the, the limits of the site that we're looking at today. Um, I'm sure we're all familiar with this map. This is, uh, this is the overall 500 acre master plan um, site area. With the, um, you can see the, the plan is rotated so that north is actually to the left here. So we're looking at Route 1 to the right, highest parkway down here to the plan south at the bottom of the page, um, Payne Road up to the north on the left hand side. Um, the, uh, so, so this plan is kind of the existing conditions, um, what's approved or built, approved or built today. So you can see phase one, which is nearing completion here, and then all the way to the north, you see the 90 acre uh, light industrial in innovation district. Um, and then the, uh, the tan area is representing generally an upland and developable area. You can see the existing grandstand location in the center of the site. And the dash line represents the existing Downs Road alignment as it exists today. Um, the green is its wetland area. And then so the, so the site is, as Dan mentioned, uh, directly north of phase one. There's some, some wetland area that we're planning on preserving between phase one and this phase, phase um, to our cell on the site. And then to the north, the site is generally defined by the outer track. Then to the west, we have Willowdale Brook and the conservation easement there. And then, of course, the uh, property boundary to the east, where we're showing a 100-foot uh, buffer. Sorry, the slide's a little bit out of order. Um, so this plan should show, this is kind of the overall vision, long-term master plan of the site. Um, and the takeaway here is, you can see, Phase one, again, down to the south, to the north innovation district. Uh, the existing downs road alignment shown in the, in the red dash. Um, you can see that we're, we're proposing to realign that road. Um, and for, I think this is items that we, we identified in the original master plan um, for traffic calming reasons, but also to begin to set up a framework um, that's very walkable and compact. Um, it's essentially a, um, a, a grid, a, um, a, a grid framework. So you can see by sliding the Downs Road to the west uh, towards the, the Willowdale Conservation Easement, um, essentially what we're doing with that road is we're turning into a boulevard condition where um, you're you're creating an edge on that that open space, which is publicly accessible. It becomes a long linear park. Uh, the alternative, more of a conventional alternative to that, might be lotting that road on both sides and double, double loading the road, um, where we're essentially we would be kind of privatizing that that asset. So the goal is to is to realign the road for um, again for traffic coming reasons, and also to set up this begin to set up this uh, this block grid system where we can do these very compact um, and adaptable uh, various land uses. 
um, but also to open up that, that open space uh, to the, the public as much as possible in the neighborhood. Um, so you can see our site area generally 20 acres, 22 acres um, here in Orange. To get into so this is the the corner condition I might actually stand up and present to the boards a little bit that's okay so this is our specific site plan um, the concept is FTC was for sliding the down road to the west here's the village of conservation easement uh, we're maintaining roughly 50 to 75 feet from from uh, Willowdale for grading and for open space purposes. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Oh, sure. Yeah. Sorry, Nick, we're going to ask you to. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm not being recorded. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Can you hear me? Is it coming through? Okay. Um, so, this is our specific 20 acre site plan. You can see Downs Road being slid to the west along the, the Willowdale Conservation Easement. Um, we're considering some areas for stormwater management. And then generally the land use plan is to create this compact walkable street grid. They're, they're roughly 260 by 500 foot um, blocks, neighborhood blocks. Um, and uh, density or land use is generally graduating in density from, from west to east. Um, so that we'll have a little bit more kind of multifamily um, or attached single family compact um, denser uses on this initial block, which we're starting to call block A. And then working into the site to the east, we'll have more detached single family, maybe some attached single family, which is like a, a duplex or a townhouse um, type of product, um, where, where these units might be more um, of a, of a multi-unit, uh, but also mixing in some single family. Uh, this is where, as, as Dan mentioned, um, I think the, the next logical place might be to consider a uh, kind of a neighborhood retailer or commercial or Office user, sorry, the fly. <laughs> um, so uh, it, it makes a lot of sense as you're leading into um, the town center along Downs Road to start beginning to think about that mixed use concept as you work your way in. Um, but one thing also to take away from this site and, and generally the master plan is that um, it is the first 20 acres north of phase one that's you know moving into the town center. So we're starting to begin to discuss this mixed use. Um, or a mix of uses and, and you know more denser, more vertically oriented typologies and uses, but at the same time um, we're, we're trying to graduate density. So we're considering this kind of a moderate, um, higher density single family or not sorry not single family residential um, plan. And the idea being that as we work towards the town center, it gets more compact, a little more dense, um, and there's more mix of uses. Um, in terms of circulation, it's, it's worth noting um, we're doing something a little bit different from phase one in that uh, phase one is, is predominantly um, street loaded or, um, or parking lot served um, uses. This we're trying to, um, to minimize the impact of vehicles, so we're considering a little bit more of a uh, northern New England kind of progressive idea with uh, alley or lane loading, similar to uh, Eastern Village in some ways, um, where you can actually face the, the garage onto the back or the interior of the block, and then you're, it, it allows for a condition on the street where there aren't a number of curb cuts or parking lots opening to the street. So that's a high priority for us in um, preserve, preserving the walkability and bike head aspect. We have these, these long, uninterrupted uh, segments of of sidewalk and, and trail connections and uh, very walkable streets and blocks. So, um, yeah. um, I was going to say you can touch on the green light at some point. Okay. I don't want to mess up your rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. So, oh boy. <laughs> Boom. Okay. <laughs> Wow, okay. Um, so this corner, I'm gonna step away here, kind of point, point to the master plan. So this corner is essentially standing here on the plan, looking in this way. Right. Yeah, generally looking in towards the neighborhood. So this 
is where we're starting to think carefully about um, about opening the neighborhood up. We have um, for for good visibility into the site and field welcoming, um, and also start to orient orient the the residences, the buildings into the neighborhood rather than so much onto Downs Road. Downs Road essentially becomes a uh, collector street condition that feeds these local streets, and you can start to see this is where the that that block grid um, pattern is beginning. So along that corner, you're coming in. If you're passing through the site to the town center, you're going to continue left here on the sheet. If you're entering the neighborhood, you're going to take a right, and you can see that you're automatically by design slowing down and turning in, or you're continuing on, but you're but you're slowing here. Um, you can see where we've got a uh, common area park space and the plan is to have uh, a number of these kind of neighborhood pocket parks um, sprinkled in through the site in, in very deliberate um, locations um, where they can be an amenity but also serve as some um, identity for the neighborhood. And then also um, putting the landscape to work thinking about you know if there's stormwater features um, like biocells or, or other uh, infiltration rain gardens um, that we can start to Designed into these spaces, it could be very interesting. So this corner, this is actually an inside corner condition along Downs Road. So as we're coming through, we were just looking at this corner, looking into the neighborhood. Now we're on this reverse corner and looking in. And this is a, a pocket neighborhood concept. So the idea would be these are smaller um, single family homes that front onto a common space rather than a street or a parking lot, of course. Um, and they're all alley loaded from the back. Um, they have garages. In fact, all of the, the units can have um, two car garages if desired. Um, but you can see we're, we're starting to, the architecture is still a lot of work in progress, but um, you can see that the idea is to have these living spaces pulled right up to the front of the buildings, whether it's on the street or it's on the common. Um, and they're very, very humanizing. Um, and it invites kind of interaction between neighbors. So that's about what I've got. Questions? Thank you very much.
comparing this area to phase one is um, this area of the site is a lot less constrained. Um, so phase one had more topography, it had sort of smaller development areas that were separated by uh, narrow wetlands, etc. So one of the things I think design-wise we're pretty excited about with this next phase is there's there's a lot more land available and it's it's um, more contiguous upland. So, um, but back to the lessons learned. One of the challenges with phase one was the depth of lots and therefore the, the parking um, with a street loaded single family house in particular. And so we've been working a lot on two different things in that regard. One is to focus on more alley loaded lots so that um, you're not actually coming in off of the public street. You're gaining access to your, to your garage from an alley which is privately maintained um, and therefore along the street there's not as many curb cuts and there's not as much parking uh, in the front yard. So that's one of our ways of addressing that. The other way of addressing that is there are some street loaded lots planned. Um, we've been we've engaged uh, an architectural team has been working with us on house plans and lot layouts that are geared towards these lots. And so that um, we're being very deliberate around where the front of the building is, where the front of the garage is, what's the, the driveway space, so that there, aren't, there isn't that challenge that happened on some lots in phase one. Um, I, there's other lessons learned. That's the one that first came to mind. Um, help me out, Jamal. Where did you yeah, this is Rocky Rispera. A um, couple of things we learned, you know, street radiuses, we worked, we worked with the town and staff and figured out what's acceptable, what works, what doesn't. Um, we've got some radiuses that are, that are tight, um, and we you know we don't do that again. I think street width uh, maybe is another one. I think we're all agreed that 22 really is the right number. And when we have on-street parking, we want to really designate where that is, uh, so that it's, it's, it's very defined, be much more of a, easy to build and, and more useful for the, for the residents. To back up, Dan touched on, um, I'm not sure if the, if the board was really picking up on what he was saying, when house placements and depths of the lots, we found that as we were replacing houses, if you thought about parking a vehicle in front of your garage, well, the vehicle was blocking the sidewalk. And we didn't have a lot of depth on the first lots to, to move the houses back, to slide the garage back. So we went through some uh, various techniques to, to make them work. And I think in the end, uh, the worst we wound up with would be, was maybe 18 feet from the, from the sidewalk to the face of the garage, which isn't ideal. I think 20 really is your minimum number. Uh, but we originally had situations where we weren't working on there that much. So those are some lessons that we learned. Um, Dan talked about the difficulty of the piece of land in phase one, we had a lot of uh, wetlands that we were working around, and we had fill situations. And when you have fill situations, you don't have a lot of room to, to, to fill out distances. So um, we, we had some issues with that. The, the nice thing about this next piece of ground is that it's relatively flat. Uh, and our wetlands really are at the perimeter. We don't have any internal wetlands. So uh, it's going to be a lot easier place houses, but I think the, the shape of the lots that, that Nick's team has come up with for this next phase is going to make this a lot easier to, to work with. I think I, I touched on the things I can think about on staff as has got a few. Yeah, I might just say from sort of staff's perspective, particularly at the master plan <coughs> phase of, of this project, it's really about that relationship, you know, sort of where the public realm meets the private realm, the edge of the right of way. Um, and so I think you know the team did a good job of touching on it. There's there's other elements that we'll talk about as we dig deeper into this, but I think for for these purposes, that, that's really the, sort of the critical elements. And what's that public right of way sort of look like in transition, where we are creating these spaces that are somewhat in between public and private. So, um, <coughs> Angela or Jamel, is that good? So on the, uh, for instance, on your phase one, you have a multi family buildings did, regarding on street parking. Do you, was that adequate? What you I think that was adequate. The multifamily portion of, of phase one worked pretty well. Where we had some difficulty really was with the single family house lots. Okay. Um, and, and we just didn't have as much flexibility as, as we, you know, we, we would have had in, in 
in hindsight, we probably would have done a few things different, but the multifamily, the on-street parking, uh, for the multifamily, <coughs> that all works. Because it, it seems to me, for instance, at Eastern Village, I think, okay, I'm, I'm not sure, but one of the problems there is that um, when they have, people have guests and they want to on the street, there's not, there's not enough space for them to park, you know, and um, I think that's a critical issue, right? And, and I know we did talk about that in the first phase. That's a, that's a balance we're all struggling yeah, with. We don't want to pave any more area and have to deal with any more stormwater than we need to, but you got to have enough, enough parking, and I think, Phase one, I think we're pretty close. Um, looking at the apartments and condos, probably could use a few more spaces, but I think there's opportunity as this next phase comes on, we'll be able to get some more on-street parking and pick up a little bit of that overflow, you know, guest, guest type visitors uh, parking. But, uh, but I think overall that it works. Um, the other thing I think we're going to be wrestling with a little bit is the uh, the uh, intrusions into the uh, out of the improvised track. And you mentioned that, it's, that you have a lease arrangement for the track. Sure, uh, I, can, I can touch on that. Do you have a time frame when you, in, in this this proposal you're presenting to us now, when you think you'd be able to reach your, you know, the, uh, the end results? Sure. So we think the track can certainly run at least another two years. Uh, what we've got going on, we're, we're designing this next phase to not impact the, the actual resurface. surface. Uh, and in fact, it doesn't even impact the, the practice track, although they could live without the practice track and, and, still, uh, and still run their operation. So we think a couple more years, we're working on trying to come up with a smooth transition for harness racing and figure out, you know, we know that this site in the long term isn't the place for it. The land's going to be too valuable and we need to be developed. And We've got great plans uh, coming at you for that, but uh, in the meantime, it, they can race, they need a place to race, it's got a great track, a great race surface, and uh, we want to continue with that for at least the next couple of years, uh, and work out a smooth transition with, with Harvest Racing and take it to another location. Okay, and I guess, I guess my last question would be, um, looking at your overall map, you know, the when you had it there initially, where you showed the town, the proposed town center. Um, so you know, when we're talking about mixed use, um, you, this is primarily all residential right now, as proposed. And I, I'm assuming um, the area from the uh, innovation area down to the town center is going to be residential too. Is that is that what was in your plans, your future plans? It, it could be a wide zone, it's allowed, it could be a lot of different things. We kind of have a biotech, medical, that idea in mind for the area immediately to the right of the innovation district. We think that that will creep in, in that direction. Um, there may be some, uh, on the back side, if you will, where we abut, uh, where Mark O'Leary's project is going to be and whatnot, there probably could be some residential back there, um, up along the that line, but we see more biotech, medical, and then fading into the use in the center of town. The reason I asked the question is, is, is your core going to be primarily commercial? Do you see that, or is that, are you going to plan to have some residential? I, I think that's more mixed use. That, that should have some residential, second, third floor, fourth floor residential type use. Okay. All right. I'll waste. Thank you, Roger. Uh, Richard. I've always dreamed of two of them here. Um, I, as I'm looking at these plans, uh, it, do you have any notion of the number of units that you're going to put in there? I know on one of the plans you provided a, a, a possible arrangement of housing. What, what, what's the volume that we're talking about? Between 200 and 230 in that range. Okay. Uh, and that's the single for duplex or townhouses, multiplex? Yeah, we've looked at, I think, four to six different housing types. So, two types of single family, um, alley loaded and um, street loaded. Um, we've looked at what we're calling 
cottage courts, which um, are more kind of one to one and a half story living. They could be single family, they could be duplexes, similar to the first phase where there's those single story duplexes. Um, Nick showed an image of so these pocket uh, neighborhoods that could be single family as well that are smaller in units, um, anywhere from 900 to 1,200 square feet in that in that range. Um, so I think we're up to four. And then we've been considering townhouse type units um, and then multifamily uh, type units. And um, phase one is a, a pretty good representation of a multi-generational neighborhood. Um, and the residents, the new residents really, um, though they haven't lived there longer, uh, really liking the setting where it's not just a single family neighborhood. It's just it's not just a, a retirement neighborhood. So it seems quite successful um, based on sales and based on um, quality of life so far for folks. So we're looking to replicate that in this next phase um, and have a lot of variety, not, not stick to one or two housing types um, so that it's you know, multi-generational dynamic neighborhood. Yeah. 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 One of the things that is kind of unique about this, this design that, that uh, Nick's team has come up with is those areas that you see in between the streets could be mixed and matched. So those areas are all similar in size and you could do different types of housing on those so it would be able to you know, meet market demand. And if it seems like one style is, is you know, more attractive or more desired, you could do more of those and less of something else. A bunch of different styles, but we've also got the ability to, to do different things in, in different areas. Right. So um, you can do a much better job than I can with that. That's pretty good. It's, uh, so this block, uh, block depths are all the same. We've been working on house plans and lot layouts where these could be townhouses or they could be single families, and we're presenting one subdivision plan to the planning board. Um, we wanted to design the road system and the infrastructure once um, and, and get that right, but then allow the various housing types to, to, to be based on um, based on sales, based on setting, based on um, what people are interested in. So um, if you know townhouses are going well, they can do another block of townhouses and not have to change the, the road path. And it could be out of the townhouses or out of the single family. Um, so it's been pretty deliberate in that regard to be flexible and nimble to, to create this neighborhood. Right, you, you, you've talked about neighborhoods. How, it's, it, talk a little bit more about that when you talk about neighborhoods. Are you going to somehow or other distinguish one neighborhood from the other by uh, some sort of a division, let's say a park, or by a type of architecture, or it sounds as though so you're merging a lot of architecture into it one area, but you also talk about them being specific neighborhoods and presumably as you start to phase in your building, you, you would be worth looking at neighborhood by neighborhood. I think there is opportunity to use, I think I touched on it really briefly, but I think there's opportunity to utilize the public spaces, the parks, whether they're smaller parks or larger. Um, to create a sense of identity for each of these neighborhoods. And what I would envision is that there's small neighborhood or even block scale public spaces that are discoverable in each of these blocks that provide a sense of place. So when you're, when you're there, it's kind of unique to that block or that portion of the neighborhood. And that's, that's kind of how we, um, you know, rather than put up a big, a big sign that says this is <laughs> Smith Farm, <laughs> right? That's my question. Okay. Yeah, you yeah. use use the actual plan and the neighborhood pattern and the architecture and the built environment to do your kind of wayfinding and signage and your identity. So, are, are you thinking about? Because I think this the the open space and the place making is extremely important, given the number of houses and number of units that you're looking to put in there. Uh, as you talk about neighborhoods and, and distinctions in those neighborhoods and these parks, are you talking about having each park have some sort of unique feature? Could be. And, yeah. Okay, could you expand on that? 
Well, we have a number of ideas, but um, I mean, I think there's there's a number of narratives that we can use, and one is stormwater, managing stormwater. Um, so we have you know a, a different type of stormwater feature in a different park. Maybe that's the purpose of that particular park, and maybe there's some interpretive element to it. Maybe there's some science that talks about stormwater and the, and the water cycle. That could be one. Um, another that we we've, we've talked about is. Um, and this may or may not be incorporated in this neighborhood in particular, but um, we've talked about repurposing the, the benches um, at the grandstands. Those have, those have been there for ages and ages. And is there an opportunity to start to use some of those in the neighborhoods and um, repurpose and rebuild them into maybe they're, bench, maybe they're a different kind of bench or maybe they're something else, but um, starts to become an identifying feature, um, which doesn't cost a whole lot, but it tells a story about the history of the place, um, just like you know we can tell a story about the water cycle or um, any number of things. So that's that's the general idea. And then we have, as Dan mentioned too, there's five or six different housing typologies just within this 20 acre um, phase. So we're working with a good architect. That's another part of it. You know, if you if if we have kind of sub phases within the overall phase where the architecture does something a little bit different than the next block over. Um, and that can be coordinated with the site and the landscape and whatever features we, we incorporate. Have you, have you considered how you could use the trees and the plantings to distinguish each neighborhood? Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. And I think, it's, I think it'll come down to, um, obviously, you know, you consider soils, drainage, um, but also the, the purpose of the planting, is it creating a separation from the street or is it um, creating some buffering and separation between neighbors or, or from common space to the neighbor? Um, uh, something that we've introduced on Lot 32, score builders um, on the Innovation District is uh, the idea of a pollinator meadow. Uh, so there's, there's some things like that that um, I think are pretty interesting where we can actually, like I said, kind of put the make the landscape more useful than just like a pretty thing. And so that's that's a goal, is that it's a it's a useful landscape and it has some purpose. Yeah, I, I I'll just reiterate the importance of, of that place making in, in terms of the development of the neighborhoods uh, as a way to make people feel less jammed in because you have the potential to have that given the, the density. So the more you can do uh, to give people a place to move to uh, and a sense of identity with, with the neighbors, the, I think the better off you're going to be and the more attractive those okay. areas are going to be. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Yes. One other key design component that we didn't touch on um, with the framework of this next, um, this next phase and that's the anticipating a, a, a greenway connection to the town center. So it's hard to see up there, um, but where you see it, say town center, there's a large green space that's going to be a, a park, it's going to be an area associated with the, the sports complex right in the town center. Um, and we're anticipating and planning for that, and planning for that being a center of gravity. And so, Nick's layout here creates that, that common that you see it's behind here, um, flanking the entrance of the neighborhood creates um, a place in the green space, and that links to the neighborhood park, which is linking to the road network that's going to carry all the way through. So, um, coupled with creating some places within this uh, particular neighborhood, we want to create that that framework right off the bat. Connecting people, walking, biking, etc., to where we think they're going to spend a lot of their time ultimately in the town center. So that's a key kind of design component that we need to work on. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah. Um, I'm going to start with the easy question, I guess. Um, I heard, I think I heard Mr. Urban Rosemary say that the streets were going to stay at 22 feet. That was a lesson learned, and staff had sort of asked about that, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, right. So it will stay at 22 feet. Perfect. Or, or greater. Okay. 
Um, and I understand the sensitivity with adding a more impervious area. Um, another quick sort of question is, what are the number of affordable units in this phase? Okay. So there will be, there's a requirement for 10% of the total number of units. Mm -hmm. uh, so there will be at least 10% of 200 to 230. Super, and, and I well, no, it'll be provided in the project. It's yeah. not going to be in this phase. Great, and so in phase one, yeah, that's great to hear that you have, I think you had said 77 units, you know, to credit forward or whatever, but you're on track to use the affordable housing. That's, I, for me, that's really good to hear because we you know sometimes that gets kicked, that can gets kicked down the, the road a little too long. Um, so those are some easy ones. My other questions are, what are some of the off-site off improvements that are, are anticipated? Are you guys able to talk about that at this time? We don't have details at this time, but we just applied to DOT. Okay. So we've submitted a, a big application, okay. um, and they're going to be redoing it as with the town over the next few months. So we'll talk about so, that later yeah. in this workshop. I'd like to build on what uh, Mr. Bealey talked about as far as lessons learned are concerned. Um, I think in the staff comments they, they mentioned two places, well, Crest Mill and Eastern Village, and maybe one other place. Um, I'm going to just put it out there that you know one of the issues with Eastern Village is the, the alley um, uh, sort of formation and I know that you've been, as you said, deliberate, deliberate about the design and infrastructure, but what lessons learned are we bringing forward from Eastern Village and from Crystal? I think we're looking at it. I think we're, we're being very thoughtful and deliberate with our alley design to accommodate truck and emergency vehicle snow plowing um, movement. Um, so it's, it's actually, it's very deliberate, we're also providing, I think, a little bit wider um, paved area than Eastern Village, so we're relaxing our, our dimensional standards a little bit, I think, more so than, than uh, Eastern Village, and I think we have a more um, truck emergency accommodating site while still accomplishing a lot of their, like, urbanist objectives. So. This is, I mean, Eastern Village, and I'm sure this one will be very beautiful too, I mean, it does bring a wonderful aesthetic, um, but it's just nice to know that we're taking those lessons learned and moving forward. So, is there are there any other lessons learned from those offsite projects other than um, alley design or configurations and geometry? Or are there any other sort of ideas from those lessons learned from those offsite developments that you bring into this one? We talked about it a little bit earlier, but it's essentially visitor guest parking. So Eastern Village. There's a narrower street, and also there is an on-street parking. Um, so alleys, even if they're designed well, guests don't typically go up down alleys. Guests come to your front door of your house. Mm -hmm. So we're being deliberate about providing on-street parking for that additional parking and not having it be just people parking on the street without space. And then building on um, Ms. Hendrickson's um, comment about placemaking. I'm actually going to fold this into because I know uh, our chair asked us to sort of put it in context of elements in the, in the um, staff comments. I guess I'm a little disappointed, and, and, and I hate to end because I swear to God, this is my last comment and question. I'm a little disappointed with the realignment of the road actually getting closer to Willowdale Road. Um, because if you look at you know, for example, along the, if that's north, that would be eastern boundary, we need at least a 100-foot buffer to the property boundary. But I think I heard in your presentation that we only have 50 to 75-foot buffer to um, Willowdale Road. And the reason I bring this up and this is um, a part of the state permitting is that Willowdale Brook is, an, is uh, listed by DEP and EPA as a urban impaired stream, um, and part of, uh, I, I don't know, I, I can't remember, right. is it just urbanization or impervious area that is leaving this watershed impaired? It's threatened. Oh, it's not impaired. It's not impaired. It's, it's threatened. threatened. Okay. And it's listed as for, because of 
Okay, so the threat is development in general, and what's happening here is we're bringing development closer to it. So, where I'm going with this is I'd like to know one thing, like how this is getting folded into your uh, CDP permit, but I think it's a missed opportunity if we don't think about it in terms of place thinking. In fact, this neighborhood could almost adopt below Dale Brook and, and want to do things both within their neighborhood, but upstream and downstream. I think it could potentially be a missed opportunity if we don't wrap this into the place thinking. So I have a couple comments from Nick and as well. Um, so the, the setback to the stream is um, going to vary from I think 100 to 125 feet. So it's not 50 or 75 um, on the on this plan development side of the stream. Um, and the intention really for kind of bringing the road um, closer to the stream or bringing that element is between the street and the 100 to 125 foot setback is proposed to be uh, a bike path, a rec trail, and some green space. So the road's not going to be right up against that distance. It's going to be buffer and then landscaping with the bike path and then um, the downs road. But the idea that, and Nick will do a better job explaining this, essentially from um, where you see the road straighten out all the way up to the town center. Most of that distance is going to be this, this essentially boulevard where there's stormwater features, there's um, pathway, there's landscaping, and there's um, that type of environment, not kind of the backs of buildings or parking lots draining right into the Yeah, I can see that. It's definitely an opportunity. Yeah. Um, but I would just remind you that bike paths pedestrian paths are still impervious area and in addition to being impervious area they also have a lot of dogs and will have dog waste issues and you know we, we want to make sure that there you know there's these pesticide issues so I'll, I'll leave it at that but I welcome anything else that you wanted to say to respond to that but I guess I would just like to see um, to understand how uh, the proximity to Willow Gale Brook is affecting permits and the place making. I can I can maybe reiterate a couple of Dan's points, but also um, the purpose of, of pulling the Downs Road. One of the one of the main purposes of pulling it west um, was so that we didn't end up bisecting a portion of the neighborhood and kind of cutting off that piece um, and, and introducing you know a, a busier road um, through the neighborhood. So we're trying to keep the neighborhood intact, but also the idea that. Uh, I think I mentioned this, I'm not sure the point came through, but the, the road essentially by pushing it up to, uh, not right up to Willow, the, the Willowdale Brook buffer, but a reasonable distance to where we can grade and we can create some uh, a linear park space. But still it's a modification of, of the natural hydrology that's, yeah. that's getting close to it. And yeah. that's what we're, uh, my concern. Yeah. And I'm I sure that it, they'll address it through the permit. So. Yeah, and I think we should, we should be very deliberate
a 400 foot coffee shop or something. I, I just there, I just feel like there's even really small opportunities for something other than residential in this area that would that would actually go on to further set it apart from a lot of our other residential neighborhoods in town. Um, I I'm I'm currently curious after looking at this map as to the the rough footprint of what you're proposing in my own neighborhood. And I desperately wish every Saturday morning there was a coffee shop that I could get up and walk to. Um, and to add to that, a playground. Um, and I would love to see the playground that you designed. <laughs> um, because I think that it could, you know, it could incorporate a, a lot of the topics that have actually come up tonight in general. Um, it doesn't have to be like blue powder coated and metal stuff. Um, but in terms of kids or it could be, you know, outdoor stations or something like that. Um, you know, I, th I think you're, you're, you're on the right track, obviously, by including um, park, park space and greenway and all of those types of things, um, but that would definitely be something I would be jealous about this neighborhood. <laughs> um, and just, you know, just to, to further on that and the, um, the point that you made earlier about incorporating um, affordable housing units, you know, just to get personal for a second, my mom, who is uh, self-employed, lives in um, Central Maine, and uh, owns her own business, um, she's a seamstress, and so she has, she has a very small uh, studio space, but constantly has customers coming in and out. Um, she would love to live in this area, not the Downs in particular, but the rest of our family is down in the southern part of the state. But based on her um, line of work and income, um, it's it's cost prohibitive for her to come here and rent both um, a housing unit and a space to work. And so, you know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a, again a, co a coffee shop owner, or someone who maybe lives upstairs from their space down below, or some other sort of um, you know retail like high commercial kind of pop in pop out type of use. I'm not really sure what what that looks like, but it does seem like that could be another opportunity for integrating even different both different types of residential and um, commercial component and community um, placement and all those things. Um, I had a question about what you so staff sort of alluded uh, to this, but I'm just a little bit curious about how ongoing track operations would integrate with this neighborhood as fully built out um, until the point at which the track is not operating. So like, for example, the, um, actually it's interesting, this graphic does show your road development fully extending all the way to the east, but there was one other graphic, that included this one actually, sorry, yeah. So, you know, for those, for the properties that are intended to be right up against the back of what the practice track is now, I'm just curious, what what would those, what would those people reasonably expect um, to have in their backyard if the track is still operating at the same time? So, we're going to have to figure that out before we get there. Um, we know that the track is going to need the practice track to operate. Uh, it's not our intention to actually impact that in the initial phases of this, this piece of the project. But um, I think we can coexist for quite some time. And yeah, I think it's a couple of years. Uh, it's going to take us a couple of years to get this get this built out. Uh, but I think that we're we're sensitive to what their needs are and then what our, our buyers and, and residents' needs are. And uh, we're going to we're going to figure that out. We'll probably have a little more information for you when we get back. Sure. Great. Um, question about the alleyways. Uh, someone mentioned that they would be privately maintained, and this is maybe more like too detailed for this point, but or at this stage in the game. But I'm curious if that's intended to be like a, a like a homeowners association situation, or something kind of larger or smaller. And the reason I'm asking is because um, if those are designed to be relied heavily upon for primary access in some cases to different residences. I was just curious about sort of continuity, you know, between from one to another or along an entire, an entire stretch of alley. So, we anticipate those are um, 
part of the Homeowner Association private the cloud um, and maintained uh, much like a condo development would be in phase one and, and many others. Um, and then it would be a larger it would be a larger association where multiple alleys would be uh, maintained by the same contractor. Um, so just pretty good kind of models out there for that. Um, lastly, I guess just to also reiterate the staff's comments about providing designated on-street parking, especially in the, in the case of otherwise um, narrow roads, I, I do think that's a good idea and I wonder if potentially, you know, thought could be given so, so I can appreciate, you know, wanting to only um, mobilize for your street infrastructure at one time and not to really revisit that. But, um, you know, as we've seen already with some of the, uh, the smaller site plan developments that are coming in, you know, maybe the option for reserving on-street parking space in front of more dense residential or, you know, a pocket of parking, uh, on-street parking space between a few single-family homes. So, you know, for example, if you had um, guests, and it might not be something that's anticipated as being needed early on, but, but after people have lived there and kind of experienced that, um, to have that as an option might be just forward-thinking um, a good idea. And then my last question um, is a little bit past the line in the, the comment that Nick asked us to stick to, but um, it has a question to do with uh, the garage parking topic actually that came up earlier, so the lessons learned from your phase one in terms of having um, parking space in front of a garage, and that uh, the point was made that all of these units have the potential, I know not all of them, but units have the potential of, of having um, two car garages. And so I was just wondering if there's any incentive being thought about um, for non two car garages or the no car garage or no garage, I guess, would be the case. Um, thought being, this just reduces the demand on a whole lot of, not just the infrastructure and the immediate frontage of this property, but you know, when you start adding all of this up, um, to have some sort of incentive, and I, and I don't know what that is, if it's, uh, it's cost, I mean, there's certainly a, a monetary component to not, not developing that for someone, someone not purchasing a garage. But also overall, you know, when you start adding up trips and offsite mitigation, um, road maintenance, all those types of things, I just think again that uh, having some sort of incentive program, and I know that you have a very a, a skilled team behind this and can probably come up with something really creative, but would again be another very unique selling point for this uh, type of community that we can, and really be a leader for um, Scarborough, which, you know, our neighborhoods, our built-up neighborhoods don't have this. All of our built-up neighborhoods are definitely designed for driving, and many of them have one, two, three, or more car garages. Um, and so I think in terms of, you know, placemaking, imagine if you took the space that it would take to build three two-car garages and had, um, I don't know, a common picnic space or some, something in between, you know, with just a, a higher and better use and, and offering that as um, an, a real amenity in addition to some sort of incentive. So, yeah. buy into that. We're spending a lot of time on the, the transit side of this and conversations and are pretty excited to report that we, that the Soccer Bitterford bus service is going to start service, I think, in a month or two. Um, and so we're, we're kind of dipping our toe into that arena um, with the first phase. In fact, there was a, a block party um, for phase one a few nights ago where there's food trucks and um, some fun games. And we got the, uh, the, train, the bus service to come and, and be part of that so people could talk to them to learn about bus routes, to be exposed to the bus and learn that, hey, it's a new bus, it's pretty comfortable. And let think about writing on that. So we're, Trying to take measures like that that are smaller steps right now, but that can lead to um, families and future buyers to be interested in the neighborhood if they are kind of in one car or no car. Um, so I, I, I kind of think it's an incremental thing. I appreciate the, the goals, and um, 
we also, as part of our traffic permitting process too, we think that's a pretty big component where if we're going to be pushing um, rightfully transit service and multimodal um, transportation, we need to be sort of looked at in that vein too by DOT around intersection improvements because if you just build the, if you just build everything based on cars, then it's the incentive to not have a car gets reduced. You know? So it's we don't want to overbuild intersections because because that could um, stifle alternative transportation too. So I think that's related to uh, the next round of permitting with DOT. But we're trying to take those steps for future residents, also for employers. Um, and there's already uh, end users interested in the innovation district that want to see uh, or hoping for transit service. And that's a harder nut to crack because that's off the the of the bit of her um, transit line. So um, we're about worried conversations with Metro about what they extend their service down from the main line. So that's really kind of tied to, to your goals there. And um, I think Nick has um, been trying to design that regard as well. Um, or we've been asking for one and two car garages also because right now market demand says people want them, but is that true in five years? Um, it may not be if we have alternatives. Thank you. Uh, Rick? Yeah, um, you took my alleyway private public road away, so I don't have that question anymore and that was answered. On your common areas here and green spaces, is there an intention to maybe put in some sidewalks so you can access different parts of that and get to the, uh, the residences um, in a different way than having to walk the whole parameter? So will there be a network of some sidewalks in the common area? Yeah, and I think the, um, I just want to emphasize that plan is more or less a, a diagram just to show that there is pedestrian Mm -hmm. along the street. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at your other one where you have designated sidewalks. Yeah. And, and just wonder if some of these may have some Absolutely. shortcuts in them. Yeah, there's, a, there's another layer of, of design detail that we haven't gotten gotcha. yet. Yeah. Any consideration on using some of the open space then maybe for uh, the opportunity of doing um, neighborhood solar uh, where the groups, the neighborhood could opt into a PTA or something of that nature and, and uh, kind of incorporate some of the uh, sustainability uh, building practices. That I would just say we, we are thinking of it. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if parks in the open space are the right. Yeah, I, I'm not saying like that, but in a designated park where you think that some of the outskirts or maybe even in the stormwater management area where you can put some solar panels right over that and, yeah. and have that available for neighborhood opportunities. And in along that line, it may be an incentive for having a house that doesn't have a garage. Uh, they might have uh, solar on their house at a better cost than it would have been if you were going out there in the marketplace. It could be used as an incentive, but at a minimum, maybe we should consider where it makes sense on the placement of the roof lines of, of these neighborhoods, that they be kind of interconnected or wired or given some thought about interconnection with some solar. Uh, which brings me to my question on the power grid here, is it going to be underground? It's going to happen. The neighborhoods are all going to be underground. There's going to be overhead along the Downs Road that's... Why are we doing overhead on the Downs Road? Is there a reason why we don't bury that? Because it, it's three-phase power, mm -hmm. um, and the artery power system um, needs to be three-phase, and that the cost of three-phase power and project like this it's astronomical. So we have an artery overhead power system that we run to down to like phase one does to get to then serve the neighborhoods along it and get to the town center and to connect to the innovation district. Um, I would trust your landscape architect and would make sure that we don't have uh, 
the trees that are planted here, the ones that will interfere with the overhead wires, so that we don't have power outages that we just experienced in pretty severe case. Yeah, and we're it's another one of those um, detail components that we're looking at pretty closely and intentionally, where um, we can have a 70 foot, 70 foot wide enough right away along down to, to accommodate overhead power and separate it, so we're actually creating a kind of a utility corridor behind the street tree planting. That's, the idea is that you can still use the street trees, but there's, you're reducing or minimizing the conflict and also starting to screen the lines, obviously. That's really, I mean, I'm looking over some of the recommendations or, or thoughts that the uh, staff had put down here, and I, I think you're touched based on, on most of what I had as a uh, follow up for that. So. Interesting thing to know, too, on the plan, I think um, you, you touched on solar. Um, these actually have a really good solar orientation, too, if you, if you think about the, the no, long ridge line. Just, yeah. or kind of <laughs> in the right that was one of the reasons why I brought it up, because yeah. uh, yeah. I think it would be a good opportunity. And we don't want to miss that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Rachel. Yeah, uh, all of this conversation has given me uh, some thoughts about what you might want to look at in terms of some of the commercial or retail, a strip that feeds ultimately feeds into the town center. Um, and as we started to talk about neighborhoods, I was thinking, what, what does a neighborhood need? Uh, and what businesses could survive, let's say, when, once you get maybe 50% of this built? One of the things that could survive in that area would be a child care center. Uh, that would be wonderful. This community I, needs child care, like, you would not believe. Just so I heard. A child care center next to a coffee shop um, would be something that I think would draw members of the community uh, into that area. Um, a co-working space doesn't have to be, fan, you know, doesn't have to be large, but you're going to be getting people who aren't necessarily going to be commuting or want to commute every day, but would like to perhaps go to a co-working space with a coffee shop next door and a child care center on the other side. Um, so start to think in terms of what a neighborhood, what, what would the people who live in this neighborhood like, even though the streets are cut off, you know, before you can get to the town center, what sort of businesses would be supported in that area. Uh, and I, I think that area that you designated is a potential. Uh, I think that's right for the sorts of places that actually add to the placemaking of the community, bring people together, provide a service, and ultimately then as well feed into the town center. Yeah. All, of, all of those different uses have been talked about, so it's, it's good to hear um, from the planning board on that, and we'll think about how to integrate those and where they should be, because uh, there's at least one, um, more likely two daycares are interested in being within the project. Um, we'd love to have a coffee shop. <laughs> I can't. Can't yeah, with a drive through <laughs> <laughs> It's my opinion that a coffee shop has to have a drive through or it cannot survive. <laughs> and we cannot have a drive through in the cell. It's one of the only things we can have. And co working spaces come up as well. So where's your um, great ideas and working on trying to land some of these. Thank you. Uh, Roger. Yeah, uh, I have a question for Steph. Um, I need your portal. Um, it's your intention to use the, um, is it called the Highlands at times? As your affordable housing com um, equation, you know, in, in your equation. Um, now that's an over 55, page, page over 55. Is that going to create a problem in, in the definition of affordable housing? I don't believe so, but we'll certainly take a second look at that. But that, I don't believe that would cause any issues. Um, we, we reference affordable housing. We do talk about in our ordinance, we do have senior housing, but we also have affordable housing, and we don't really differentiate once you get into affordable housing. But okay. 
fair question, but I, I don't believe that it's going to cause any trouble. Okay. And just two of the quick ones. On the, uh, on the dead end streets going into where the large track is, um, as I understand what you're saying, Rocky, is that by the time you get to that portion, the track should be pretty much resolved. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that should not probably be an issue then. And I think that's really going to be part of sort of an ongoing discussion around phasing and, and you know, when it's appropriate to uh, start to approach that area. And so I think that, that is something we can yeah. keep, continue to flush through. Sir. Okay. And the last thing, I think I, I read something, I couldn't put my hands on it right now, but um, reading about the parking areas, um, the, the decided to have impervious, some impervious parking areas there. And I just want to mention, um, I don't know, I haven't seen many around the Greater Portland area other than USM on the sidewalks, but up at the um, Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens in the new parking lots up there, I don't know if anybody's seen them, but they really did a nice job because from the, uh, the curb where they did drive the car in, about, I'd say, six feet out, it's impervious. No, it's impervious, I mean. It's impervious. Yeah, it's impervious. I got you. And yep. then, you know, it's, and it's, it really looks pretty good. I guess it, I guess it works pretty good. So yeah, it, it looks good. And it's yeah. So you've seen that? Yep. Okay. Okay. So, excuse me if I might jump in. The, uh, the site you're on more where the savings and uh, Starbucks is. That's pervious paper. Pervious. Not on the site. It's pervious asphalt. Asphalt. Yep. Okay. You have to look closely, but it's yeah, that's pervious asphalt. Okay. Is it, Rocky, is that because there's geothermal uh, to use a water source? No, I think it, that? it had to do with stormwater permitting. The Hanford up in, in Augusta has that surface, but it actually covers the, the wells for the uh, water source heat pumps or the geothermal system. Uh, and that's what made the Hanford the first, I guess, platinum lead building in, in, in the state as far as supermarkets. That's how they charge. To recharge. Yeah, just to recharge it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, good job to my colleagues who picked through most of the questions. I have pretty much just two in there. Just so on that map up there, the existing downs road kind of cuts through the Close your 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 thinking. <laughs> So yeah, so you see the red dotted existing scrubber downs land? Yeah. Come right there. How come that section won't remain connected? Am I missing not am I not be reading the master plan correctly? Yes. Right. Is there any reason why you wouldn't leave an extra connecting road there? Yes. Um wait, 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 wait. <laughs> <laughs> I'm satisfied. <laughs> So as part of our bigger picture conversations with DDP and Army Corps of Engineers around wetlands and natural resources, um, we've talked to them a lot about the concept of actually removing the pavement um, of the Downs Road there, given that this road could be improved to provide access to the center of the project, and we've selected that segment intentionally because it could kind of reconnect the um, this wetland in Vernal Pool to the largest wetland on the site to kind of bring the natural system not entirely back to the way it was, but more back to the way it was um, and felt like that was a, a good approach um, and to kind of concentrate on making a road improvement here and concentrate on natural resources there. So it's really kind of a, a wetland mitigation compensation measure that uh, we think can, can be an asset to, to the site. Uh, what we are envisioning there is to, to keep uh, a surface so that there can be a, a bike path or a rec path so that the public can get out into the wetland area or by the wetland area and, and um, be in the, the natural environment, but to remove what's now feels like 40 feet wide of a driveway. And maybe it's 30, probably more. 30 to 50 feet of, uh, of driveway coming in. It's so. a 70 mile zone, you know. I know that. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but it's a thing that obviously needs to be fixed. You know, we need to get to that point where it's appropriate to pull it out and have good access. But just to point out that you know it'll still be knit through. It just won't be that 70 mile an hour cut through anymore. It'll come in down an intersection, you go up the Hikes Parkway, go up into the project, and come back out. It'll still all be knit together, but it just won't be that real way that exists today. And uh, thank you for that. Um, and my follow-up question is, um, in our packets, um, I'm missing something that I'm seeing up on, which is another road, or it looks like a connection, possibly to an adjacent property. Plans you have up there. You see, we talked about this this year. You know, go to go to the, the plan that looks like this for me, the blown up version. That uh, right there. I see on the top you have there what looks like it's supposed to go to the body property on our packets. We don't have that, and I was wondering what the reason behind that extension. Yeah, I just been an earlier version. Um, our intention is to. This might not line up correctly, but our intention is to have a pedestrian connection to the Sawgrass neighborhood, which provides a stub. Okay, up so that's stub that that's there currently. Yeah. So are, you, are, you, are you looking at this? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, from a purely design standpoint, I'm looking at that as not a great lot for a house to be at the end of the road, and it's better to put open space there, and, and that provides a trail connection. Actually, it just from looked like a road from here, and I was wondering where it was going. Yeah, it's, it's just a open space connection. So, the plan would make maybe familiar with the fact that we can't connect a road, this road system cannot connect to the soy road system. We could connect the pedestrian. The, the sawgrass road, and I don't know where it is on it's here, it's it, it's okay. it comes right to the property line, so we could connect a pedestrian way. Through there, but we can't connect with the You know, I can say from the sawgrass perspective and from the project we're looking at, um, I think it was referenced earlier, I'm trying to remember Mark Leary's project's name on hand. Uh, right yeah. <laughs> the, the cottage, it's um, the board has really talked about maintaining those 50 foot wide right of ways right to the edge of the property. The zoning could change in the future. There's no conversations happening in town right now around that, just to clarify, but it could change. But that does provide for the ability for connection of utilities, uh, pathway, whether that's a paved or just an informal sidewalk. So um, uh, maintaining those uh, connections are still important for many other reasons. So uh, I guess I hope that helps to answer some of your questions. All right, and then uh, I think that was that was the, pretty much the bulk of my questions that hadn't been answered by my colleagues. Um, for staff, is there anything that you wish we had kind of brought up or hashed out a little bit further um, before we walk away from tonight's workshop? So it sounds like the board are generally comfortable with the direction. I think there's just some details to sort of bed out here, but. And as far as. Uh, Applicant goes, are you um, relatively comfortable with what you've had for feedback? Anything that we you'd like us to discuss before you meet with staff at a future date to go over some of the details? Yeah, that's great. I really appreciate it. Um, we'll update our, our submission and um, come back to staff in the board. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, and I'd like to just say, you know, it's, it's looking good. Um, you know, I'm very impressed with the team. Uh, and what we've seen for submissions coming through. It's been, for a very complex project, you've, you've done a really good job here. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So, um, that said, uh, we don't have any other business this evening. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Second.